Funding for Inner Compass is provided by Calvin College. The life that's unfolding. The world that awaits. Gifts that are yours to explore. And God's to use. It's all happening here at Calvin. Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm June Hammersma. Afghanistan was a flourishing center of trade for 2,500 years until the Soviet Union's southern border sliced the region in two. If the area can again prosper through the sharing of resources and ideas, there will be room for stability and peace. Our guest today will explain how this process has already begun. Join me on Intercompass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is author and scholar S. Frederick Starr of the Central Asia Caucus Institute, which provides a forum for researchers and policymakers at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Starr was a guest on the January series of Calvin College. Fred, it's wonderful to have you back and uh, having you speak about all of the stands, Afghanistan, Turkestan, you know, the whole, that whole area. And uh, I guess the first question I want to ask you is, is there a new unity arising uh, for a greater new Asia? A very or will it happen question. from outside? It's a very interesting question because these are very different peoples. That's right. We're talking about this vast zone between China, India, Russia, Europe, the Middle East. Let's call it Central Asia. And it's made up of about eight or ten different countries, many of them ending in Stan, land of. <clears throat> and very different. Some of them are Turkic, some are Persian, uh, Persian speaking. Uh, they look different. Some look Oriental, some look middle, more Middle Eastern, some look more almost, almost Indian. So ethnically and di culturally different in many ways, and yet they're all coming to realize that they have a common interest in opening up the great continental trade routes again, and they can only do that by working together. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's the, but it's so, very slow. So that's where the silk trade routes come the through. Old, yeah. The old, old silk, silk route, which wasn't, by the way, just silk. No. I bet, and which, it was two directions. It's right. <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, I was just reading this morning about the Crusades and uh, how the, the silk trade, you know, in quotation marks, how that was affected by the Crusades. So it's been a problem throughout history. Well, getting goods, you know, when I'll bet when everyone watching this went to high school, they were told that there, there are two continents, one called Asia and one called Europe. That's right. But if you, you know, just look on a big map, uh, doesn't look like two continents to me. And I, I remember being told that there was a mountain range called the Urals that separate Asia from Europe. Well, the Urals go about the middle there. Uh -huh. They stop halfway down. That's not, and they're, they look like a kind of broken down Alleghenies. They're not serious mountains. So, so what you have really is a single Eurasian landmass, a single continent, which can only be one continent if they're actually in touch with each other. And of course, never... most of those stands, Turkestan and that yeah. sort of thing, have been part of the Soviet Union. Yeah. And they were therefore, hidden. yeah. And therefore, they were not, uh, well, they did, were not public republics or That's they were right. not private countries. Yeah. And now we find that each one of them is different ethnically, religiously, yeah. the, and all other ways. And they're, and they're sovereign. But, exactly. But because they're now able to make their own decisions, or nearly so, 
they are increasingly deciding in favor of opening up the continental transit and transport routes again. That's, really? That's really exciting stuff. In other words, remember, again, what we learned in high school, mm -hmm. that in the 15th century, the Portuguese discovered clever way of getting to Asia by sailing around Africa. Well, mm -hmm. why did they do that? Because the little Khanates and Emirates in this region were charging too heavy taxes. Now the descendants in Central Asia are saying, well, let's, let's open up the roads and railroads again and let's lower taxes and let's make it possible for truck traffic to go from India to Europe or from Middle East to China. But Fred, where is this unity coming from? Reality. Very interestingly. Nobody's dictating it. It's not unity yet. But they, everyone analyzes the situation and says, wait a minute, this is where the action is in the transport and trade. And interestingly enough, Afghanistan is the key. Afghanistan has always been the key, hasn't it? Yeah. You can't get from Europe to India, from the Middle East to India, without going through Afghanistan. And do we understand what the real problem is in uh, Afghanistan? Is it the Taliban I, and uh, I, making a comeback? I think or? The, I, yes, that's part of the problem. But more serious is, is Pakistan. The, the problem in Afghanistan is Pakistan. <laughs> Uh, it's their neighbor. And, and that's been true ever since the exodus. And it's true because there is a big area along their common border that basically government doesn't penetrate. And wherever you don't have normal government, government functioning, as in Somalia and so on, you get the worst kind of, of uh, not just terrorists, but all sorts and of strange And we're talking activities. two very different groups of people very religiously. The, the religion is totally different, well, and that's... Well, you have, these are, what's going on is, is very curious, because over the centuries, the Afghans have actually been very moderate in their Islam. Uh, very, very moderate. Uh, they... I would say they're like traditional Catholics in a way. A lot of, every little village has a shrine to some saint and so on, which by the way, Muslim sainthood was itself picked up from Christianity and Hinduism and so on. Mm -hmm. Every little village has that and they're very traditional in their outlook. And now what's happened though, in this border zone of Afghanistan and Pakistan, especially on the Pakistan side, you have a lot of groups coming in from the outside which have really radicalized some of those people. And that's where the Taliban came from originally, and that's where the problems today arise from. And it, of course, has a lot of outside funding in the Middle East. And the, the border is fluid. Yeah, that's a problem because, you know, the Afghans want us to defend that border but they don't want to recognize the border themselves. What do you think is the worst problem for Afghanistan, the Taliban or the poppy crop, seed crop? Uh, you, you know, the, the issue of drugs, poppies, opium, uh, everything that comes from it, heroin and so forth, um, it's demand driven. It, if there weren't demand, and the demand is in Western Europe and Russia, if there weren't demand, there wouldn't be. Exactly. And, and the problem is, we talk about eradicating opium production in Afghanistan. If that were to happen tomorrow, it would move somewhere else. So the problem is ultimately demand. Now, within Afghanistan, people are not eager poppy farmers. They much, traditionally, this is not what they did. They did 
fruits, dried fruits, best dried fruits, biggest oh, wow. production Gorgeous. of dried fruit, raisins, all raisin brand in America, 20 years, 30 years ago, had raisins coming out of Afghanistan, interestingly. Um, that's all stopped because over 20 years of civil war, the fruit trees were all cut down for firewood. The, the, the vines were cut down, the grape vines, and so on and so on. Now that is all growing back. It's all being replanted. But it takes time. It takes years. We gotta be, we've got to understand that until they have a normal source of income again, they have no choice. You know, the, the best book, the pop, best popular book I have ever read on uh, Afghanistan is James Michener, uh, Caravans. Yes. It's yes. a marvelous small novel. Yes. But I understood Afghanistan in a totally different context, and it's 25, 30 years old, but it's a marvelous well, You know, it's often been said that oh, Americans don't know Afghanistan, and there's some truth in that. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a, a couple of notable American scholars and others, but back, now we know, back in the 1830s, it's a very colorful Quaker named Josiah uh, Harlan from Pennsylvania who found his way after an un, uh, unfortunate love affair at home, found his way off in the wilds. He eventually became an advisor to the king of Afghanistan and actually the governor of a province there. And, and so we do have a certain history of contact and, and, and quite positive contact. And history. it's always been peaceful Yeah. I, I, until now. Do you think that the breakup of the Soviet Union into all of these little tiny republics has affected Afghanistan okay. as well? Yes, and very positively. Um, but the reverse is also true. I mean, we're in a very dyspeptic mood right now. Uh, can't do anything right. Everything, everything that we're doing internationally is criticized. But the reality is that destroying the Taliban government in Afghanistan and the, making the first steps toward establishing a normal kind of situation there, and we really have. We've done a lot. I mean, schools, bridges, highways, you name it, uh, has addressed the biggest security problem in the entire center of this Eurasian landmass. It's the worst problem for the new countries of Central Asia, the other their neighbors. It's the worst security problem for China, for Russia, for even for Iran. And, and the U.S. did this. And everyone in the region knows that that's the case. And the people who don't know it are the Americans who read the New York Times, because <laughs> it's never in there. What, yeah. what, what tremendous strides we have made there, and uh, how valuable our contribution has been it, to Afghanistan. It, it really has. I mean, just for example, the possibility of, of transit trade going north and south, I mean, this, this changes life for every, not just the people along the way, but uh, if Indian goods can now go up into Central Asia, and if Central Asians and Afghans can sell their products in India, as is possible as the roads begin to open. Uh, it's a transformation. Then they can have a normal life. And we've done it. On the other hand, the situation is still very fragile because of this Pakistan problem. What do we do about Pakistan? This is really the Rubik's Cube. Uh, it, it's Pakistan, aside from being a beautiful country, it was spectacularly interesting. Uh, and full of very, very bright and entrepreneurial people, has a problem uh, in that it was, it's an artificial country. It was made up of completely different peoples. And, and when it was established, there was immediately a move, movements arose for secession, mm -hmm. not from one side, but three or four sides. And as you know, they lost part right. of their country. Now, Pakistan is still a kind of made-up country that hasn't fully taken root. Um, what can we do to strengthen the government's ability to rule in those western areas adjoining Afghanistan? That's the challenge. Who has a common interest with us on this? Interestingly, China. 
China has been Pakistan's most steady ally. We've never discussed this with China. Uh, be a worthy discussion. Who else has an interest in stability in Afghanistan, in Pakistan? India. Isn't our influence somewhat limited? By uh, attention deficit disorder? Yes. <laughs> I really mean that. <laughs> I, I think that's the biggest limit. Because, you know, immediately when you talk about what are really extremely promising achievements and prospects in this greater Central Asia region of which Afghanistan is the heart, people immediately ask, well, what's it going to cost? The reality is, this isn't money. The issue there is, is the U.S. going to use its good offices as a convener, as a, as a credible force, which it is there, or is it not going to, you know? But then who would be involved, Pakistan, the U.S., and? Everyone. I okay. think all the neighbors. But there are a lot of other interested parties that aren't neighbors. You could say that, you know, the essence of this central, greater Central Asia is that it is the only place in the world where such diverse, with such diverse neighbors from the Middle East, Europe, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, these are totally different worlds. Um, now, they all have an interest in seeing this region peaceful. Many of them are nuclear powers. Of course. But there are others further afield who also have an interest in, in this area. Japan is a major investor. It's been the most generous humanitarian, a giver of humanitarian aid. Korea, there are Koreans in Central Asia that were dropped there at the end of the Second World War by Stalin. Korean trade is very active there. Europe is far away, they have an interest. So I would say everyone has an interest in stability and success in Afghanistan and Central Asia. Uh, is there the will to come together? I think so, but you need, but, who can convene that, well, you know, you and I may have independently the will to meet, but we mm -hmm. may be very proud and we may be very conscious of rank and so on. And we may be prepared to meet and years can go by without our meeting. We are waiting for some third party to bring us together. And that third party can be the U.S. The United States Department of State reorganized itself this last year. It used to have this whole region under Europe. It moved it from Europe to South Asia. So for the first time, you can talk about former Soviet parts of Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, all under one, in one discussion, bureaucratically. That's a big step. And on that basis, we're hoping the U.S. will play a more active diplomatic role. You have been very, very active in Central Asia, even founding a university in Kazakhstan. And uh, how do you see each one of those countries working together or not working together? I have to remember, these are new countries. Yes. Uh, they're ancient civilizations, but these are new governments. And, and you know, there was not a, an Uzbekistan a hundred years ago. And Uzbekistan was created by Soviet map makers and politicians. And, and it was never independent until 15 years ago. So uh, we are talking about a lot of countries that are behaving the way new countries behave. And that is extremely protective of their sovereignty. Remember George Washington's farewell address. Uh, he, he cautioned against getting mixed up with other countries, you know. Focus on ourselves, yeah, you know. Right. This, is, this is the way they're all doing. Uh, they'll get over it. They'll become more cooperative with one another in time. 
Uh, uh, and, and I think in time, as they understand that this trade in transit, transit could include transport of energy, pipelines, it can, electric energy, electric lines, as well as roads and railroads and air, air flights. All of those require cooperation if they're going to work. And as they sit down and calculate the advantage to them of exporting our electricity, let's say, from Tajikistan across Afghanistan to Pakistan, mm -hmm. they'll say, we've got to do it. We've got to work with these people. And I think that will create the better relations. How do you see the the U.S. fitting into this? Because we're you know we're talking for about an area that is critical to yeah, yeah. our history. I, and I, I think it's I think it's a wonderful prospect for the U.S. specifically. Why? First, we aren't we aren't part of that trade directly. If we act there to foster trade, transit, and so on. Uh -huh. We're clearly doing it in a disinterested way. Uh, when the Chinese do it, the Russians do it, they, everyone understands they have their very specific interests. Now, beyond that, though, remember, these are almost all Muslim countries, but very moderate. They mostly have secular governments. They uh, certainly uh, favor modern Western type education. Um, they view themselves as however remote, but in a way part of Euro-Atlantic civilization. And yet they are a bridge between different worlds. This is to have them develop successfully creates a very different and very positive alternative to the Arab model of development. But you see, that's the model we see. And for the average person, uh, they don't understand that this is true of that whole area. Rather, it looks like they are militant Muslims. They Muslims. really aren't. Uh, uh, this is a very, very different world. And by the way, they, they have the view, and it's not a ridiculous one, that the style of Islam that is favored in many parts of the Middle East today is a kind of corruption, that it has been kidnapped, that the rather traditional and much more moderate style of Islam that prevails in Central Asia and has in Afghanistan down to Taliban times, um, and again today, uh, that, that this is the real thing and that that was created here. And they point out to the fact that, they point out the fact that the codification of the main documents of the faith, the sayings, for example, of the prophet, the, the, that codification was, compilation was done by a Central Asian. It wasn't done in the Arab world. It wasn't done in the Middle East. And over and over, the, the Sufi movement in Islam it runs from the, you know, from the Atlantic coast and Morocco all the way through to Indonesia. The, the, this sort of inward-looking, uh, reflective, contemplative, more mystical uh, uh, current, it came from Central Asia, not from the Middle East. This is so wonderful to hear, but I have to ask a very quick question, and that is, we know that poverty must play a huge issue in that part of the world. It does, but these are developing economies. The Asia Development Bank, uh, which is uh, largely Japanese financed in Manila and is focused on development, studies this region very carefully, says it's the fastest growing economies in Asia, Asia or in Central Asia. Now, maybe you, you, you reply, well, that's because they begin with a low base. Still, people there know that economic life is improving, and not just because of oil and gas. What I would be most interested in is how we can get 
the kind of information that you've given us today, it's not available. Occasionally you read it in The Economist or Foreign Affairs, but... Well, you know, it, it is interesting. Uh, this is... The problem is not information, it's concept. You know, the notion that if you begin this, it's looking at this greater Central Asia region of which Afghanistan is the heart. If you begin looking at it as a, assuming that's a, a zone of endless trouble, mm -hmm. conflict, controversy, the worst kind of governments, etc., right. you can get enough information to document that. I think it's a fundamentally wrong view, but the, 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 it's not just is there the information, it's what kind of intellectual, what kind of framework, what kind of analysis do you bring to it? And I think a dispassionate and, and if you will, an analytic approach comes up with very positive conclusion to that. It's been wonderful having you, Fred. Uh, you've just opened up a whole new world and in a very much more positive way. Thank you so much. My guest today has been author and scholar S. Frederick Starr of the Central Asia Caucus Institute at Johns Hopkins University. I'm June Hammersla and thank you for watching Inner Compass.